kicked off with, uh, with this slide. Remember, we're discussing uh, methods by which altitude would possibly affect sea level performance. I'm pretty sure that it has to do with um, red cells or carrying capacity, and this describes the hematological model, blood-borne model of how altitude training confers benefits at sea level. And so we're looking for ways or we're evaluating if blood, specifically if red cells, are central to that adaptation. And so outside of spending time at altitude, is it possible to manipulate red cell content? We did that by uh, reinfusing blood from an individual or blood doping. We're looking at it here with the administration of recombinant EPO. Both are mechanisms through which red cells proliferate. Hemoglobin goes up, carrying capacity increases. And in this situation where we have synthetic activation of EPO and production of new red cells, after only, uh, this is six week data, but we saw in the last slide it took three weeks until the changes happened. At the end of this protocol, we see about a 10% increase in VO2 max for the individuals in the uh, EPO group, whereas a control individual, negligible change in VO2 max. That's within the limits of variation of the calibration of the Metcard itself. So there's a fairly stout observable improvement in VO2 max, the amount of oxygen that can be taken up and consumed to do work. Now, like with the last study, we want to see if performance is improved. Does this translate to anything meaningful? A high VO2 max is not performance, but it's your ticket to the show. If you have a low VO2 max, you're not going to compete. If you have a high VO2 max, you can't compete, but then skill and other factors come into play. This study took a, a bit of a different approach. Instead of looking at time to exhaustion or time trial performance, this is assessing what we call VO2 onset kinetics. The idea being that maybe the way that the machinery is turned on initially has impacts down the road in uh, delaying fatigue or increasing performance. And what we're looking at here are, again, pre and post data. So dark circles are before the... Um, EPO administration, open circles or triangles in this case are after the, uh, the administration, either of nothing in control or EPO in the bottom panel, at three different intensities. And these intensities are a little bit odd. They're not typical. They're labeled as moderate, heavy, and severe. And while we typically say X percent of VO2 max, these are X percent of ventilatory threshold. And ventilatory threshold is, is meant to be a whole body measure of anaerobic threshold or possibly lactate threshold, although they're not one to one. But it's the intensity above which exercise is unsustainable over long term. Over the long term. Ventilatory threshold is the pace where um, you want to be as close to this level as possible for race pace. You can sustain all the way up to and just below ventilatory threshold for long periods of time. Above ventilatory threshold, you get increased acidosis and signals that fatigue will ensue. So moderate is 80% of ventilatory threshold. Heavy is 90% of ventilatory threshold. And in both of those cases, you can see the exercise carries on, not indefinitely, but at least to the end of measurement here, which is only six minutes. But uh, you can see that this carries on further. As soon as you get over ventilatory threshold, 105% of whatever that threshold would be, individual, I'm giving you a typical range here, but over ventilatory threshold, exercise is short-lived, cut short in the three-minute range on average. Everyone's ventilatory threshold is different, just like everyone's VO2 max is different. But it's a slightly different way to express the intensity of exercise. What we're looking at on this slide, the only difference we can observe is right here, 
severe exercise in the EPO group after EPO administration, we have a higher VO2 um, or a higher O2 consumption in this really high intensity exercise group and a longer duration of exercise. So there's an upward and rightward shift of this curve, meaning that the onset kinetics, the ability to turn on the machinery is larger and can be sustained a little bit longer in the EPO group at this really high exercise intensity. No differences in the moderate or the heavy group, at least in this small window. And I wouldn't take that to say there's no difference at all. It might simply not be captured by the six minutes of um, observation that we've limited ourselves to here. There might be a difference when you get to the end or, or the voluntary exhaustion point of exercise, whatever that happens to be. There might be similar separation when you get out towards 10 minutes or an hour and we're running out of wall. But on, on the short term, the ability to turn on the machinery certainly improved at high workloads with EPO. We don't observe that in the control group. These are direct overlaps in all conditions. So there seems to be some rather convincing evidence that red cell content contributes to improved performance. And if hypoxia, hypoxic training, some stimulus can improve red cell content, we can confer a benefit in performance. The reason is is what you would expect. We know from our high altitude section that low PO2 is a stress. The body doesn't operate optimally under that stress and so it tries to adapt. It adapts by releasing EPO from the kidneys, erythropoietin, which activates red cell formation because that stress requires more hemoglobin to uh, saturate the blood and deliver oxygen to the tissues. Now we've shown here that just manipulating red cell content improves VO2 max and improves what I'm calling high intensity exercise capacity because we saw time to exhaustion go up in the first example and then the onset kinetics in that high intensity bout just now. So fairly sure that race pace type um, activities would be improved with a higher red cell content. VO2 max unequivocally improved with a higher red cell content. Which is why this is a desirable method for athletes, certainly competitive elite athletes, to try to, try to squeeze every last bit of performance out of um, their body, out of what they're capable of. Now to contrast this, there is a non-hematological model. And this was uh, largely the model to which Lance Armstrong attributed his dominating success in the Tour de France and uh, throughout his career. Not or, or unrelated to uh, red cell content, there are changes that are controversial that are observed with altitude training. And the reasoning for this could simply be, well, we saw in the last section Sea level um, or, or land dwellers, low land dwellers that move to altitude and adapt increase red cell content, but people that live at altitude don't necessarily show the same thing. Their hematocrit is often similar to low land natives, if not somewhat lower, which either suggests maybe on the short term red cell content goes up, but maybe it comes back down. Maybe we don't need it long term. Maybe there are other things that adapt to improve survivability at altitudes. Maybe it's not red cell content or hemoglobin that confers the greatest benefits. Maybe something else that we're not observing is really what we should be targeting. Something in the muscle, something at the lungs, we're not sure. Or maybe it says... There's not one fixed way to adapt to altitude. Maybe there's a lot of genetic variability, which is a point that we're going to come back to today. There is a lot of genetic variability. 
compound that with on an individual basis, if you are to change red cell content, if you blood dope, use EPO, if you measure a change in hematocrit, it doesn't correlate one to one with a change in VO2 max. This isn't the only thing that limits your ability to take up and use oxygen. In that long physiological chain, you need to be able to ventilate properly. You need to be able to transport into the blood. You need to be able to have muscles that use oxygen to a high degree. Carrying capacity is not the only thing that could limit VO2 max. And if you're um, a correlation buff and you, you like R squared values, you know, an R squared of one means perfect one-to-one -one relationship. R squared of zero, very poor, no relationship. In some cases, R squared is 0 0.1, 0 0.2. It's poor. Then to the point that we uh, talked about today, VO2 max changes don't often dictate performance. Something else could contribute to your uh, competitive edge or your ability to sustain high workloads. And the things that we're going to talk about are perhaps muscular efficiency, the ability to do more work for the same amount of oxygen or the same amount of energy consumed. Maybe that is affected. Or there's some indication that after this altitude training, your ability to buffer the production of acid in the body goes up. Your ability to buffer acid goes up. So we'll talk about those two. These are other potential mechanisms, hyperventilation, blowing off more, um, more CO2 and, and helping to buffer acidity again. Uh, 2,3-DPG is a metabolite and glycolysis that affects how well hemoglobin can bind oxygen. We're not going to look at any of these. These are, these are potentials that are unsubstantiated, but there is a little bit of information on efficiency and buffering. These are unrelated to red cell content and hematocrit. They might mean there are other reasons, or um, they might be reasons the non-hematological model could be um, invoked, or, 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 or these changes could be attributed to the non-hematological model. So efficiency, <clears throat> doing more work for a lower O2 cost or doing more work at the same O2 cost, or simply decreasing the cost of the exercise. We observe better economy in individuals that have trained and lived at simulated altitude for 20 days, three weeks. There's been a report, this is um, out of a fellow named Ed Coyle's lab in Texas, of simulated altitude measuring VO2 over a range of running speeds in elite runners and we see a downward shift uh, in all cases of VO2 for a given workload. So here across a range of race paces 14 kilometers per hour to 18 kilometers per hour at all points along that range VO2 is lower after this simulated altitude. What does that mean? Oxygen consumption is lower. That means you can either sustain this pace for longer or for the same oxygen cost, you can run slightly faster. Both of those things would improve race performance. So overall, there's a 3% reduction in VO2. Taking all these points together, a 3% reduction, which at the elite world level is a large improvement. This is unrelated to any other measurements. It's not due to a change in carbohydrate or fat oxidation. If you switch substrates, the amount of oxygen you would consume might also change. You get, you get more energy when you burn carbohydrate than when you burn fat. No difference in carbohydrate oxidation. This isn't due to any change in 
indicators of acidity. So lactate release from the muscle is not different, yet VO2 goes down for a given workload. Critically, for this to be another model, it's unrelated to changes in hemoglobin. Total hemoglobin, when measured after these 20 days, is not different, yet VO2 is lower. And paradoxically, there's no change in the ventilatory response that might help blow off extra CO2. None of these things can explain this improved efficiency. So there's some other mechanism. It's an innate characteristic of being exposed to altitude that naturally makes you more efficient, at least according to these results. And it's unexplainable by our typical understanding of how these adaptations occur. Maybe there's substance to the non-hematological model. Efficiency is improved. This was the argument that uh, Lance Armstrong used repeatedly in explaining his performances, and this is um, a timeline of his efficiency from, um, from a fellow, Ed Coyle, the same, uh, the same lab in Texas, did repeated measurements with Lance Armstrong over the course of his career from the early 90s until the uh, early 2000s, over which you can see he won a uh, world championship at the age of 22. He famously had cancer and underwent chemotherapy at the age of 25, came back to win his fourth world championship, and then started his dominating performance at the Tour de France. Seven wins in, what, eight or nine years? Here, Ed Coyle, uh, measuring his performance over time, attributes that improvement to changes in efficiency. And so, to understand this graph, um, ignore delta efficiency. The squares along the bottom, it doesn't really give us a different uh, message anyways. Delta efficiency is the, it's a ratio of efficiencies over different RPM ranges. We don't, that's too complicated. What we, we care about is gross efficiency, so total workload for the oxygen cost, which is essentially kcals per minute, if you will. Gross efficiency improves from about 22% to 23%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but over the course of 20-day competitions, four hours per day of cycling, this will add up and contribute to a, a rather dominating performance. And that Lance, uh, Lance Armstrong's peak exhibited a six liter per minute VO2 max with a body mass of only 70 kilograms. I don't know why I haven't calculated the uh, mils per kg. That's something in the 90s, 92 mils per, per kilogram per minute. Really, really high. If you uh, frame this in a slightly different way and we look at his 5 liter per minute workload, which is essentially a VO2 max type workload, the workload at the highest... Um, mm -hmm. VO2 max he would exhibit. Given his body weights at these points in time, his pound for pound performance improved by 10% over these 10 years. From 374 watts near max to 404 with a decrease in weight. And he attributed the, um, the decrease in weight to losing a lot of fat mass and muscle mass during chemotherapy. Some of the chemotherapy treatment was to be administered steroids, which would have helped maintain muscle mass and um, also helped to stimulate red cell production. 7% body mass loss overall during chemotherapy, which helps create this nuclear warhead of an athlete. Of course, famously, the uh, Stop at Nothing documentary, which is great on Netflix. I'd recommend watching that if uh, you're at all interested. Throws all of this out the window. We realize that during this entire time, he was certainly injecting with, with EPO, and these benefits were not necessarily only due to improvements in gross efficiency, or at least the change in gross efficiency might have been due in part to his increase in red cell mass from injecting EPO. So not as clean cut uh, was
was this poster boy for, for cycling, uh, cycle racing. The fact remains, efficiency goes up. We can't explain why it went up on the last slide either. The only piece of information that I could dig into and find that might even back this up goes back to uncoupling proteins that we've seen before. Remember, we use these in the cold stress section when we wanted to waste the energy we had invested in making the gradient in the mitochondria, and, and doing that helped us stay warm. It was a good thing to waste that gradient in the cold stress section, but wasting that gradient is really bad for efficiency. It's really bad for performance. In this case, we don't care about staying warm. If we're competing and exercising, we're warm enough already because muscle contraction gives off a lot of energy. So is there any sense that coupling in the mitochondria changes with hypoxic exposure. If it did, if they were more coupled, if we could funnel more of those protons through ATP synthase, we would make more energy. We would be more efficient. And there's no information from humans. There's some limited evidence in a rat hind limb model, so using the uh, leg musculature of rats, over 200 minutes of hypoxic exposure, we see this um, rapid induction, this large increase in UCP3, in this case, not UCP1, uncoupling protein that is uh, specific to skeletal muscle, big increase, a 400% increase at 100 minutes of exposure. And this is extreme exposure. So these rats being laboratory animals, are poked and prodded and, and submitted to some pretty extreme conditions. 10% oxygen for anywhere up to 200 minutes. If they survived, they'd go to 200 minutes and then they'd be done. Some didn't survive. And the equivalent, if you were to calculate based on the, um, the PO2 and the concentration of oxygen on the, the peak of Everest, the equivalent uh, concentration at the peak of Everest is 12 to 14%. So these rats are higher than Everest level oxygen percentages for 200 minutes, three hours and 20 minutes. Pretty severe exposure. You wouldn't expect this level of induction in humans. You wouldn't expect this kind of exposure in humans, but this is a potential mechanism to explain why efficiency goes up. Maybe if humans also induce uncoupling protein uh, 3, am I reading this wrong? Down regulation of UCP3 might prevent leakage in mitochondria. What we're looking at here is not down regulation. Percent of control, 400% at 100 minutes is more UCP3. Did I take the wrong graph? The message is right. UCP3 goes up in this model, but that's not what this graph is saying. I'm not crazy, right? You're, you're along with me in this, this weird journey. It goes up. Uncoupling protein going up means there is more uncoupling, which is not good for efficiency. Okay, I got to table this find the paper and the, the image that I actually want and bring this back. I'm not actually sure if this is the right image. The message is correct. We get more coupling in the rat hind limb in this um, severe exposure condition. I don't think I'm showing you the right graph, though. Message is the same. More coupling, less uncoupling three. Means better efficiency. Let's leave it there for now at the risk of it being too... Uh, too complicated and convoluted. The message is what you want on that slide. So there's some indication that efficiency goes up. A lot of the indications are from the same lab, and there isn't a lot of substantive, uh, substantive evidence to say this is why it goes up. We don't really know why or how it goes up, but it's one possible mechanism to support the non-hematological model. Another potential mechanism 
is the improvement in buffering capacity. So at race pace, near ventilatory threshold, you're producing a lot of acid. Uh, acidosis runs rampant, and if it gets too high, it, it sends signals to the brain to shut off exercise. You don't like being acidic. If you can deal with that acidity, well, you can push yourself to a higher workload, or you can hold out longer. Both of those things would contribute to improvements in performance. Now, hyperventilation is, is a classic response to hypoxia. A sympathetic stress driving the removal of CO2, uh, relieving that acidosis and increasing pH, helping to ventilate and load O2 into the body. So this is one potential, uh, potential mechanism that would result in an increased buffering capacity. Overall, that means we're getting rid of more protons. Therefore, any incoming protons are dealt with we have a greater ability to deal with the protons that we are producing as a result of exercise. That culminates in being able to produce more protons or produce protons at the same rate but for longer, which I'm loosely translating to workload, higher workload or maintain the same workload for longer. And in measurements of human muscle, where we try to get a sense of what buffering capacity is, and that's what this, this value is here, this beta m, it's, um, it's a method where you titrate a chopped up muscle homogenate. So you, you take a muscle sample, you put it in a test tube with all the things it needs to work properly, and you set it at a certain pH and then you add acid to try to drop the pH. And in this case, it's uh, moving from a pH of 7.1 to 6.1. What we're looking at is how much acid needs to be added in order for um, that pH to drop. Or what is the buffering capacity of that muscle sample in a test tube if it goes up like it does in the hypoxic condition, and I'll tell you what, uh, that acronym stands for in a second, that means there's a, a greater ability to deal with that acidosis. There's no such ability in the control group that didn't undergo this 23 days of, of simulated altitude. This does also contribute to an improvement in efficiency, so it's not separate from that last example that we just talked about, but this is another piece of the puzzle to support the non-hematological model, this increased ability to buffer acidosis. Now the, the LHTL is live high, train low, and we'll talk about those training paradigms in the next section, which will probably be on Tuesday. There are different paradigms to stimulate these adaptations quote unquote naturally, live high, train low is one of them, and it's generally the, uh, the most robust and uh, scientifically agreed upon training paradigm that seems to, to confer the largest benefits. Live high, train high is another, live low, train high is a third, live low, train low is what we always do, so that's not really uh, included in those paradigms. But live high, train low, 23 days of simulated altitude in this paradigm increases buffering capacity, greater ability to deal with acidosis. All told, if there's an effect of the non-hematological model, it's small. There's a 3% improvement in efficiency. There's maybe a 5% improvement in buffering capacity. All the reports seem to come from the same lab, and they haven't been validated externally. That, plus we don't have convincing mechanisms to say this is why that's the case. What is it that makes buffering capacity go up? We measure it in a test tube. Does that happen in the body? 
Is there something being added to the test tube inadvertently that might affect buffering capacity? What is it about this buffering capacity improvement or about the uh, change in efficiency that supports the non-hematological model? There's no convincing mechanistic theory. And after that gaffe with the, um, the UCP3 figure, we're even less convinced moving forward than we might have otherwise been. Overall, the, the improvements are likely very small, and it seems that compared to the well-established improvements we get when we increase hematocrit, when we increase red cell content, that the non-hematological model mechanisms may be a, simply a drop in the bucket. It might be like sharpening your skates to perform well at hockey. It's something you, maybe you want to try if you're trying to eke out any last little bit of performance, but it's not something to rely on to confer the greatest benefits um, from altitude training. Now, I want to briefly touch on um, one tangential idea, and then we'll call it before we get into the, the, the paradigms. So I have to go pretty soon. But this is the idea of... Um, generalizability. And you can extend this concept to any realm of science. The idea that the mean does not describe the individual experience. And really, any difference in the individual experience has to be due to some effect of genetics. And there's some suggestion here more than in other places that genetics plays a role. Genetics in perceiving low PO2 or genetics in making new red blood cells. This is a, a realm, or this is a situation, where the individual might dictate the response, not the stimulus. And we get this idea because when we apply a stimulus, there is a rather large variability. Same stimulus, altitude is fixed. The training program is fixed. Yet, some people respond and some people don't. If the stimulus or the intervention is fixed, a difference in response has to be due to the genetics of that individual. This introduces the concept of responders versus non-responders. And it's not something that I like to go into a lot because it's cherry-picking your data. It's saying, okay, well, I, I looked in a population. Some people showed the trend that I wanted. Others didn't. So I'm only going to look at the people that did what I wanted to do. I'm going to spin my results in a positive light so I get an effect. And I don't like doing that very often. But there's a clear-cut difference where responders exhibit rapid induction of EPO. We're comparing individuals to, uh, or, or groups of individuals, to fairly sized groups that clearly responded versus those that didn't. And this is a 28 day live high train low altitude program, about 2,500 meters, so moderate altitude. Looking at the data as a whole, mixed bag. But we can clearly separate out individuals that responded. And this response, what I mean by response in this case, I'm not showing you, but EPO turned on in 30 hours, so just over one day's time. And it was maintained for at least two weeks. That increase in EPO increased red cell count. It decreased runtime, so improved performance. VO2 max goes up. Steady state VO2 goes up. Overall, all the things we would expect from the hematological model better performance, better carrying capacity in these individuals that responded. Same 28-day uh, training camp, same altitude, same stimulus, but all of the responses that we observed in that first group were blunted in what I'm calling non-responders. Separating out these individuals, their 5,000 meter runtime got worse. Their VO2 didn't really change. Maximal steady state VO2 arguably did go up somewhat, but it's not statistically significant. And in fact, no response of this 28 days at altitude in this subset 
of the testing population. So how is it possible some individuals respond so well, others don't? The group on the right picked their parents right. And that begs the question, is it appropriate to generalize findings like this or any findings? Should you present mean plus or minus standard deviation and say the population at large does this? More often than not, it's, it's not the case. And here, it's highlighted by this massive variability in response. So what we're looking at over here on the right is um, a time course of the adaptations in response to a hypoxic exposure. So this is, if you move to altitude, how long does it take for you to see a change in red cell volume? And we see wild variability. This is not generalizable. There's not one recommendation where you can say, OK, after 400 hours, this will happen. Some individuals see a 10% increase in red cell volume after 200 hours. Some individuals, at that same point in time, see a 2% decrease in red cell volume. And the scatter is really what I'm trying to describe. There is an average relationship, which is the red line in the middle. That's what you'd report in, in a paper or a, a scientific presentation, a study, a poster, etc. But the scatter is large. And the scatter is not different by sex, men and women show patterns like this. They're, they're equally dispersed in this plot. It's not a sex effect. It's not an effect of body mass. It's not an effect of initial fitness. This is a difference in their innate response to hypoxia. Something is more or less sensitive internally that creates this scatter around the average relationship. We think there are some roots in our old friend HIF-1. The variability in our um, expression of EPO, in our change in red cell volume, in the adaptations to hypoxia, might come from differences in the HIF-1 protein. This was hypoxia inducible factor, something that turns on when you go to altitude. If the protein is shaped differently or there's a slight variant, that would imply there might be some difference in sensitivity to hypoxia that confers a different adaptation. That's not unreasonable. And if you look at HIF-1, and this is a brief foray into uh, the structure of HIF-1, and it's not meant to be too confusing, but when you turn on HIF-1, you do so through signals to what's called the HIF response element. Signal gets sent here, HIF-1 gets produced. HIF-1 senses low PO2, red blood cells are made. And this HIF response element is variable. It's structured differently in responders versus non-responders. It doesn't give a complete explanation, but this is the initial basis or the inkling of an effect for variability in hypoxic response. What I want you to look at here is two different kinds of HIF response elements. The place where we register the signal to turn on uh, HIF-1 and to start producing red blood cells. This receives the initial signal. You can sequence it out and figure out what all the base pairs are, but generally there are two main structures. 
There's one that has uh, 185 base pairs and then another one. And we're just looking at the gross separation between these two kinds of HIF response element. Well, in high responders, more often than not, they tend to show this specific type of HIF response element. In non-responders, that same type is not obvious. It's present less often. And this is the genetic root that we think could result in the variability we saw in the last slide. This might mean those high responders have just a better adapted HIF response element and they're more sensitive to changes in PO2. Low responders aren't as sensitive because they don't have this optimal, we'll call it, 185 base pair HIF response element. Now it's not a smoking gun because sometimes the allele is present in non-responders. There's still four individuals that show that element, but they still don't respond. And sometimes it's absent in responders. Seven individuals that respond don't have that uh, HIF response element. So the picture's a bit bigger, but generally, if you separate out individuals that have that correct sequencing versus those that don't have the correct sequencing, EPO is expressed differently in response to hypoxia. You send individuals with this uh, optimal allele, this optimal form of the HIF response element up onto a mountain. EPO is induced within 24 hours. We see a large induction versus individuals that don't have that allele. Send them to a, a mountain within 24 hours. Almost half of the EPO that's produced in the responders is shown there. So divergence in the sensitivity of the individual to hypoxia might have genetic roots. Maybe it's not appropriate to say, oh, going to altitude for this long or going up this high will make you respond. There's clearly a difference in the individual capability to respond. Now given this discussion, we're going to move forward into the next uh, few sections, the, the training paradigms, using generalizable averages. So I'm still going to come back and synthesize a message at the end that says, if you go to this altitude for this long, you can expect this percent change. So I am going to generalize, but this is a really important caveat to that. If what you observe in your experience isn't what I'm telling you at the end of the, uh, the section, Maybe it's due to some difference in your own genetic sensitivity. It's possible. You need to be aware that this exists. So I'm going to call it there because I've got to go and run and prepare for this meeting. But um, when we come back on Tuesday, a deep dive into models of altitude training. This is synthesizing altitude, synthesizing a low O2 environment at sea level, using hypoxic tents, sleeping in these, training in these, uh, using hyperoxia, we can really manipulate the environment to be able to maximize the adaptation. And it's, it's kind of striking how the adaptation changes with different stimuli. So we'll get into that on Tuesday. Uh, I apologize for the short notice and the very uh, quick class today. I know you're all very disappointed.